Okay, so uh, let's start with Beyond Japan sketching out a decolonized way to intercultural philosophy. Thank you. I think you all to try to find this beauty that was really hard. Uh, you want first time in Germany, like me. I really yes draw to draw a sketch here with a lot of open and research questions. These questions have a personal value for me because they awaken my interest in Japanese philosophy. Before Talking about decolonization of form, it is necessary to briefly explain what colonialism is and its relation to philosophy. Since we are in Belgium, I will start with a Belgian example of colonialism. Colonialism just guised as humanitarian aid, one of the greatest crimes in the history of mankind. This photos come from the first page of the pamphlet with information about the celebration of the 150 years of friendship between Japan and Belgium. And you see this because you have all the bottles. Now. You can take our one. I want to start by quoting the words of the king, his majesty, King Philip of Belgium. I don't have more possibilities to quote sign king than I'm Belgian, I quote him. And the first lines, he says, when Japan and Belgium sing their first treat of friendship, trade and navigation, and 1866. Belgium was still a young country, busy in development, its international relations, and Japan was being open itself to the world. I want to make two observations. First observations on the king's word, uh, whose great great grand uncle is Leopold the True, the king of the Belgians, who was the ruler of the time. One of the results of this buzzly development, Belgium's international relations, was the Congo Free State. Uh, I invite all of you, wherever you read or hear that Belgia is the heart of Europe, never forget what this little young country has done to the heart of Africa. And even today, he has difficulty recognizing and apologize for it. Wherever I think I am the heart of Europe, comes to my mind the heart of darkness from Joseph Cohen. This photo shows a man in the front of the hands and legs of his little daughter, who was allegedly killed by guards for the deputy royalists in 1904. 1904. For me, photos like this should be shown in relation of the photos from the Belgian royal family, because this Belgian royal family belongs with this situation to each other. 1876, Leopold the true of Belgium hosted a geography conference in Brussels, invite famous explorers, philanthropists, and members of geographic societies to strip up interest in a humanitarian endeavor for Europeans to take in Central Africa to improve and civilize the lives of the indigenous people. At this conference, Leopold organized the International Africa Association with the cooperation of European and American explorers and the support of several European governments and was himself elected chairman. Leopold used the association to promote plans to size dependent Central Africa under this philanthropic guise. How we can see, Brussels has a tradition of uh, a city for uh, wooded conferences, like us now. The last observation about the King's words about Japan, when he say, Japan opened itself to the world. When we use reflexive verbs like open itself, it can have two meanings, or it means that subject does something in himself, as I wash myself, or means a spontaneous event. Without entering in the interesting dis discussion on this grammatical case, I do not think either of these two meanings fits into the description of this historical phenomenon. We can speak in clear text. Japan was opened like a sardine can and it was not a hidden subject that opened it. The old and still current US foreign policy that did it. Go both diplomats or the beastly ideology. Whatever you call it, open the up to the rest of the world. It was either to have its capital destroyed and to be colonized. They know what the British Empire was doing in China, that Japan has worked really hard to modernize itself and made many close friends, like the Belgians, learn a lot from his friends and later become himself an Asian colonizing force, or perhaps the only one of this kind in Asia. 
who committed crimes similar to Europeans with Taiwan, Korea, South Asia, and even part of China. It's something that Japan was not forced to do. On this topic and its relation with philosophy, I can indicate the paper of 1997 from Yoko Arisaka, Be the East and West, Nishida's Universalism and Postcolonial Critic. Philosophy is not a gift from the gods, nor suddenly fall from the sky. Questions such as what is philosophy is, or who are able to philosophize, are developed in this historical context. In this context, I want to mention Anorium Belgian, Place de Tempers. Place de Tempers. He is not a king, but a missionary, a Franciscan. The publication in 1940 of this book, La Philosophie Bantu, is influences until today the academic discussion of no European philosophy. He lives almost 30 years in the Congo, but is not recognized as philosopher or even as Africa. One of the main tests of this work says, the Bantu language does not have its own expressions which can describe your philosophy and need to be explained with the help of Western concepts. The most interesting is the parallel that I make with Martin Heidegger. My way of doing comparative philosophy. I suspect that Heidegger does the same in the respect of Japanese philosophy in a dialogue on language between a Japanese and an inquirer, wrote in 59. The name, uh, I, I, I quote him, uh, uh, the inquirer, also Heidegger himself, as the name aesthetics and what is named grow out of European thinking, out of philosophy. Consequently, aesthetic considerations must ultimately remain alien to Eastern Asian things. The Japanese uh, answers, aesthetics furnishes us with the concepts to grasp what is of concern to us, art and poetry. Heidegger, here you are touching on a controversial question which I often discuss with Conde Cookie. The question whether it is necessary and rightful for East Asians to chase after the European conceptual system. Heidegger pushes the responsibility of saying that Japanese language has no concepts to describe the philosophy for its fictional Japanese character. A dialogue full of Japanese cliches. Heidegger Japanese can be like the electric strange in Platon's sophist. I'm about that white, I am in full agreement with the researcher Lin Ma wrote about it but you can leave that discussion to the next communication. I would like to show one of my uh, central thesis uh, with this link. Philosophy takes place in language. Universal language as universal values are constructions. On this crazy drive to universals is a symptom to a specific ethno-philosophy, better known as Western philosopher or with ambitions of literary critique in dead men European made thinkers, limit society, whose colonialism, imperialism, or globalization are just another symptoms. Tomorrow we will listen to Haji Steinek as a keynote speaker. Let me quote the first few lines of his summer. An essential ideological problematic of pre-modern societies was anthropomorphism, anonymous force and process presents themselves to common sense as so many manifestations of the intentions of personal agents, be they identified as human or otherwise. There is the first line from the abstract from, from Haji. I am very interested in what he's going to say, but I'm very skeptical when we point out here in, from Brussels to other societies. We moderns will talk about the essential problematic ideology of the pre-moderns. At this point, I am more alongside with Bruno Latour with his book, We Have Never Been Modern. At this point, I would like to indicate the indispensable reading of the overture from Takeshi Morisato in the New Frontiers of Japanese Philosophy 8, Critical Perspectives on Japanese Philosophy. Fresh bucket and can be for shades of use. At really, no, not now, but they come. You can read the overture in the internet. We approximate the philosophical performance with he uh, Takeshi approximates the philosophical performance with musical performance, with a beautiful metaphor and somehow our work together in the NOGP. It's important that before reading the text, they have watched the film Orchestra Rio, the Prova de Orchestra, 
directed by Federico Fellini. This film leaves his metaphor more powerful. I quote Morisato, but I will not give any spoilers about the use of music metaphor. You have to read it. <laughs> Morisato, how might this no especially cross-disciplinary kind of philosophical practice be beneficial to those in European philosophy? And finally, it could free us to think more on our own by desiring philosophy of the cultural weaponry that has systematically doped the significance of philosophical words outside the Western tradition? Who among us can deny the value of a philosophical performance, even if it's married by scholar imperfections, as long as it can open us to matter of the greatest philosophical importance? One has to go no further than Nietzsche and Heidegger with their creative misinterpretations of the history of philosophy. That was Takeshi. First, a small observation, Nietzsche and Heidegger make creative misinterpretation. I would better say the history of philosophy, philosophy in singular, is the creative misinterpretation itself of the history at all. Better say, this is the creative history that the old man white man's club tells to himself. And this history, they always win and Western way of life, the only rational way of life around the globe. Observation two. In this sense, I have an ambiguous feeling about the James Heisek use of disarming philosophy of the cultural weaponry. Is it a colonial disarmament or it is a disarmament of the resistance that fights against this colonial expansion? With that question, I would like to quote Yoko Arisaka. <coughs> Or maybe that's the only place that you can understand me because that's here, I read it. <laughs> Postcolonial critic is helpful in seeing how Japanese philosophy claims of universality become entanglement with imperialist regime. regime. This claim became a wise form of colonizing <coughs> theology, but all this was meditated by Japan's imaginary self consciousness as the colonizer. Coupled with its cramped modernity, the category of West against East against West was as well utilized to mask the operation of colonial power. The question which remains for us today is this, how do we draw on the resources of modernity without unconsciously serving domination? Now I ask the question this way, how do we perform philosophy nowadays without unconsciously serving domination? I try to find a way out to philosophy and anthropology. Anthropology is ready to full assume its new mission of being the theory practice of the permanent decolonization of form. There is a Brazilian anthropologist, Viveiros de Castro. The destination, moreover, is a double, compromise the ideal of anthropology as a permanent exercise in the decolonization of form and a proposal for another means besides philosophy for the creation of concepts. Still Viveiros de Castro. So really, we so we really are dealing with something other than a return of the native. If there is a return at all, it is levi strauss strict return to the things. That, that's some like, uh, like Russell in this, in this way. No? The return of philosophy to center stage, not, however, according to his suggestion that this would entail a mutually exclusive choice between our philosophy and theirs. It another case of homonomy, so much the better but in terms of a disjunctive synthesis between anthropology understood as experimental metaphysics or field geophilosophy and philosophy conceived as the sui genius et anthropological practice of the creation of the concepts, uh, Deleuze and Gattari. This transversalization of anthropology and philosophy, which is a demonic alliance a la thousand plateaus, is establishing a view of common objective, which is the entry to a stage, a plateau of intensity, of the permanent decolonization of form. On uh, what uh, Claude Levi Strauss uh, say about him, uh, Virgil Cass, the founder of the new school of anthropology, with him I feel in complete intellectual harmony. But I would like to end my speaking uh, something well about Brussels. And the better way to well about Brussels is tell about so Levi Strauss. I do with honor one of the greatest thinkers who was born here, 
Claude Lévi-Strauss was born at the same year that the Congo Free State ended, which sadly as well not means that the end of the colonial crimes in Central Africa. Claude Lévi-Strauss begins his intellectual career in Brazil and ends up in Japan. Take him as a great intercultural philosopher is a transgression that I would not to apologize. This philosophical kinship may explain the beautiful Japanese translation of Vera de Castro Cannibal Metaphysics. There is, there is interesting to say that uh, Viveiro de Castro has first a Japanese translation before he has an English translation or maybe a German translation. He has more attention, and this attention comes from Lévi-Strauss, on the attention that the last writings Lévi-Strauss have in, in Japan. And from this connection, I have the, the translation here, uh, from this connection you can say we can talk about a, a lot of societies, not really as pre-modern, but some he used the term as extra modern, something that's not in the same space or not in the same flow of time. But that's sort of all. I think thank you so much. Thank you. You have three more minutes yeah. left, but thank you for finishing. Yes. Like I, I, I try to make some commentaries. There, there's really another style of on a presentation. I could just uh, say some argumentations yet yeah, from Levi Strauss and philosophy, or the Lewis of philosophy, or some decolonization. But uh, I maybe don't talk about what I really talk. I talk why. What is the Japanese philosophy interesting for me? There is the first example from some how outside Europe that was really take serious in the academic philosophy. But that don't mean that there is a decolonization form of philosophy. There is, there is the, the question that on, on there is not a middle way. You can, we cannot say that uh, when you take, uh, I, I don't uh, sit here like Nishida, when you take Nishida you have the, the, the same thing. In one way, he tried to say against the westernization of the world and all that bad things that come think. In the same way, he has a nationalist side. He make Japan make all somehow the same errors and the same crimes that Europe that bring there. I think there is the, these problems that I have with Japanese philosophy at all on, on Japan as this example. Can Japan help? Yes, uh, with the anthropology. Can Japan philosophy help to understand African philosophy, to understand Latin American philosophy, or not? There is uh, my, my big question that I, I leave open here. Yeah, I think we can open the floor for questions, yes? Just one minor comment about the quote you gave in the beginning about like open, Japan opening itself. It's, it's, it's a big debate, like how to, how to present this historical event. So you could either repeat uh, Japan being a victim and victimize it also on a lingual level, linguistic level by saying it was opened. But then again, you just ignore that there's a really multifaceted aspect about like this entire process. So within Japan, there are powers pro and against opening up and there are certain economic conditions with which allowed to open up in a certain way. And so it's really like you have one sentence to quote in which they try to kind of condense like the entire process, which then is spoken by a king or by... The king, was it the king? The king, Philip or the Albert? Yeah, whatever. So the like, king of Belgium. Yeah, the king of Belgium. So in a way, <laughs> It's definitely um, an interesting quote, and um, but the entire process is even within Japanese studies so so critically discussed, like how to represent this process from the outside when you talk about this process. So um, you're definitely right in pointing out that there is a certain sense of colonial dominance still present, also in the way they talk about this process, but. Um, why not go back to this process itself and try to pick up other lines that tell a different narrative? 
So in a way, by quoting the king, you're repeating this narrative, and you keep on victimizing Japan. You could also try to be on the decolonizing side and make a voice hearable that is like kind of more critical about this process. But in the same way, and that's because I try to make a comparison with the free Congo states. I, I, I quote the Philip about the free Congo states, not about Japan. But until now in Belgium, few few people here think they make a civilatory mission. They make no crimes. They try to help. And they were until now, nowadays. They don't see that the, the we have you don't fight here in the city. One thing that say something about the scribes. That's all make all from the African stories are uh, really all holocaust. And there is the same. Uh, I'm sure that in Japan there is a lot that uh, think this build beautiful. And there is uh, these beauties have a static positive way in Japan. That is some way uh, yes, uh, but there are people that are for the modernization. There are people in Brazil that think this uh, when you say we have indigenous philosophy that's bullshit. There was people in Africa oh, in the philosophy bundle philosophy is just some kind of ethno philosophy. Which might, that there is don't prove the case that uh, how this colonized power works in and then in the philosophy, in the categories. How this uh, there is the point why the anthropology will try to get a with this that is a permanent exercise. We can never forget this. Sure. Other questions or comments? Yes. Um, I have a bit of a problem with uh, your kind of um, clash of the modern and the extra modern. Do you think that it has to be always kind of a, that they always have to be kind of enemies, or do you think there is also a kind of positive synthesis possible? Is, is the modern, is Europe just the kind of conqueror, or is it just the, 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 the people that try to enslave um, all the other people, or do you think there's something positive that can be combined with this, um, like, native and indigenous um, philosophies? I think this try to, this expression to say decolonization of Fong is a way to make this positive. But in, in a way, you need to know what really means modern and modernization. Uh, wh when when in, in Japan we say modern philosophy, that we are moderns, what, what do you mean with that? Normally, when you say moderns, and, um, we just have no chance for another forms of life. Yeah, but um, maybe because, uh, maybe there is not just one kind of modernization or modernity, maybe Japan has a different modernity than Europe, for example. So by, by having this kind of general term modernity, maybe you're kind of, I think one danger might be that uh, you are kind of generalizing different processes under one general term and then you don't see the differences anymore. Because maybe Japan has a, has a different modernity. Yeah, there is, I think, the big question. Huh? There is a big question. If this if this different modernization is enough that we, we don't like uh, Yoko says, né? Uh, how do you draw on the hazards of modernity without unconsciously serving domination? This, another kind of modernization that happens is, is enough that without unconsciously serving domination, because he, uh, sure, critic, critic né? He, from Nishida say not. He unconsciously serve domination. From this 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 philosophical project, no? I think there are both aspects in Nishida. Yeah. The, the, the problem is that maybe um, you get generalizations, and then, for example, um, you have the the modern West, and it's like the colonizer and the, the aggressor, and then you have these um, peaceful native people living in harmony, and they it's, everything's positive. But maybe they have their own kind of colonization in their own tribe, for example. There's a lot of violence going on in tribes and in uh, between tribes, so it's not that, that these um, indigenous philosophies are, are kind of um, without blood on their hands or something like that. So, so 
I, I like your um, perspective, but maybe it's more complicated and we have to bring more complexity. There is complicated, but from the perspective, from the colonies aid, that don't have a voice to discuss about this, mm. he's not here. I think that he is colonizing the process, you yeah. know? But I mean, um, we are also colonized, every one of us. We are, we are living in a kind of in a capitalist society and every one of us is exploited, especially in the academic. But you are privileged. Yeah, but, but uh, every one of us works a lot of extra hours without getting any pay. And uh, I don't know, we, we are kind of uh, part but of... But there the is a big difference between the heart of Europe that we sit in now and yet in Congo. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's, there's it's there's not there's, maybe. There's, it's, it's not so, so, so it's, it's more complicated than this kind of... Um, like it's more complicated, but this, this, this affirmative is more complicated than to serve to us to neutralize the question. That's true. I, I don't want to neutralize the question, but I want to get it more complicated. Because the reality is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? If I just may then, uh, in reference to what you just said about the uh, victimization of uh, tribes and the innocence, uh, uh, Louis, he actually quoted there, I don't know who it was, that under the guise of victimization, Japan took upon a project, an imperial project actually. So I'm not sure how that fits in what you just said, but that seems to me that it was quite a ruse there, right? So exactly what you pointed out, that's what he also said. He talked about that, in a way, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, but so. then you would say it's kind of an extension of the West who colonized Japan, and then Japan in, oh. like, imitated the colonizer. Yeah, it's what, what Japan made with South Korea, yeah, China. Of course, of course. They have learned with the Western in this sense. Yeah, yeah, but we don't have the same yeah, colonialists before that. Yeah, but then it's just an extension of the Western imperialism, and it's not kind of that uh, other societies also have a kind of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Not in this, not in this way. Mm -hmm. but, so, would you then suggest to have um, to become to become allied or to become allies of minor voices in Japan? Would this be a strategy to overcome this kind of reverse? Colonialism? Who? Or do you think it would be a good strategy to become allies with minor voices in Japan that would help to overcome this kind of reverse colonialism? I would say yes. <laughs> so why not? So instead of quoting Nishida over and over again, we could look for different authors who. I think all, all when uh, we say that Nishida makes some imperialist unconscious, it's some like to try to save him. When you say that it's not conscious, they, they make saying, that... I'm not saying it's not conscious, I'm just saying that you could, you could bring into the picture other voices. So leave Nishida a little bit aside. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, of course. My apologies, that's all the time we have for this first presentation and thank you for your interest. Let's give one more round of applause for...